All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. And number 28, lack of the spirit of loyalty to those to whom it is due. Now, if you have loyalty in your heart to those to whom loyalty is due, you can grade 100% in that, perhaps. But unless you practice that all the time, you wouldn't grade 100%. You'd grade something lower than that. And incidentally, where you grade yourself anywhere on any of these lower than 50%, put a cross mark there and go back for study of that particular point. If you grade less than 50%, you should have uh, all of these uh, causes of failure at least 50% under control. And it falls below that, you've reached the danger point. Number 29, the habit of forming opinions not based upon known facts. Now, to the extent to which you do that, give yourself a good grading on that one. And if you grade below 50% on that, begin to work on yourself right away and stop having opinions unless you uh, base them on facts or what you believe to be facts. When I hear anybody expressing an opinion on something that I have reason to believe he knows nothing about, I always think of that story to tell on... <clears throat> two men who were discussing Einstein's theory of relativity. And they got into a hot argument about it, and one of them said, Oh, hell, what does Einstein know about politics anyway in the first place? <laughs> oh, he understood relativity, didn't he? Well, there are people like that, you know, who have opinions about everything in the world. They can run their country better than Eisenhower's running it. They can tell J. Edgar Hoover a few things about his job. And uh, they could always work their friends over and improve them. But uh, if you examine them very carefully, they're not doing too well themselves, generally. Number 30, egotism and vanity not under control. Egotism is a wonderful thing, and vanity is a wonderful thing. If you didn't have a little vanity, why, well, you wouldn't wash your neck or your face or have your hair curled or marcelled or whatever it is the women do to their hair. You have to have a little vanity, a little pride. But you can't have too much, can't you? I think lipstick's a wonderful thing if it doesn't get on my shirt. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can have too much lipstick. The rouge on the face is a wonderful thing, but you know nature is a pretty good old hand at painting faces, right? just right. And when I see a 60 or 70 year old woman painting her face up to look like a 16 year old, I only know that she's just fooling herself and nobody else because she's certainly not fooling me. Egotism and vanity. The ego, the human ego is a marvelous thing. There are a lot of people who need to build up of their ego. They have allowed the circumstances of life to whip them down until they've got no fight left in them. No initiative. No imagination. No faith. Your ego, your human ego, that's a wonderful thing. If you have it under control and don't allow it to become objectionable to other people. I have never seen a successful person yet that didn't have great confidence in his ability to do anything he started out to do. And one of the purposes of this philosophy that you're studying is to enable you to build your ego up to where it will do for you anything you want it to do, no matter what it is. Now, there are some people whose ego needs to be trimmed down a little bit, but I'd say there are very many more that need a build up than there are who need a squishing. Very many more. Number 31, lack of vision and imagination. I have never been able to determine exactly whether this great capacity for vision and imagination is an inherited quality or an acquired quality. I think perhaps in my case it was inherited because I have, I have had a lot of imagination right back to the earliest days that I can remember. And that was one of the things that got me in difficulty in the early days. I had too much imagination and didn't direct it in the right direction. Giving a human being all of the equipment and all of the machinery and all of the mechanism with which to detect lies from false, falsehood from truth. There is ever something present in the falsehood that does notify the listener of it. it, uh, it it's there. You can tell it. You can feel it. And the same thing by the same token uh, when uh, someone is speaking the truth. The most finished actor in the world couldn't deceive you if you would use your... Innate intelligence in reference to statements that are made. Scandal mongers. Now, by the same token, uh, when you hear uh, someone overpraised by a doting or loving friend, <laughs> what about that? 
Well, now that is, that, that's a compliment and it's less dangerous to uh, depend upon that, but certainly if you want the accurate facts, then you will study, uh, the, you will study the remarks of, uh, of a complementary nature just as closely as you study the others. For instance, if I send somebody to you for an employ for a job and I send along a letter, a very, very laudatory letter, or get you on the telephone and give you a sales pitch about how what a marvelous person this person is. If you are an accurate thinker, you're going to know that I'm rubbing it on pretty thick and you better be very careful how much of it you accept, that you better do a little outside investigating. Is that right? <laughs> now, please understand, I'm not trying to make doubting Thomases out of you. I'm not trying to make cynics out of you. But I am trying to bring to your attention the necessity of using this God-given brain that you have with which to think accurately and with which to search for the facts, albeit though when you find the facts they may not be what you're looking for, but there they are. There are a lot of people you know who fool themselves, and there's no worse, per no worse fooling in this world than the fooling that one does for himself. That old uh, Chinese uh, proverb which says, a man fool me once, shame on the man. You fool me twice, shame on me. People just never seem to think that, uh, to do a little accurate thinking, a little investigating, you know. And you can't imagine, the, um, you'd think that bankers, for instance, would be so shrewd that a, uh, that a confidence man couldn't come in and take them. And I heard, a, I heard one of the most outstanding confidence men in the world, Barney Birch. I don't know what's ever happened to him, but he used to operate here in Chicago. I got acquainted with him once and, and interviewed him on several occasions. And I asked him what, kind, what, uh, what type of men were the easiest victims. Well, he said bankers, because they think they're so damn smart. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> I'm quoting him. I'm quoting him. That's what he said. Well, anyhow, you'll not pay too much attention to scandal mongers and gossipers. Uh, wishes often are fathers to facts, and most people have a bad habit of assuming facts to harmonize with their desires. Did you know that? <laughs> Therefore, uh, you have to look in the looking glass when you're searching for this uh, business of uh, locating the person who can do accurate thinking. You've got to be uh, put yourself under suspicion a little bit, too, haven't you? Because if you wish a thing to be true, oftentimes you'll assume that it is true and you will act as if it were. If you love a person, you'll overlook his faults. You'll never see his faults if you love him a great deal. But really and truly, we do need to watch ourselves in connection with those whom we admire most until they have proved themselves entirely because I have uh, admired a great many people who turned out to be very dangerous. Very dangerous indeed. As a matter of fact, I think most of my troubles back in my early days came from trusting people too much, letting them use my name. And sometimes they wouldn't use it wisely. That's happened five or six times in my life because I trusted the people. Why did I trust them? Well, because I knew them and they were nice people and they said and did the things that I liked. <laughs> Be careful of the fellow that says and does the things you like because you're over going to overlook his faults. Don't be too hard on the man who steps on your corns and causes you to re-examine yourself. Don't be too hard on him because he may be the most important friend you ever had in your life. The person who maybe irritates you, but causes you to examine yourself carefully. Uh, we all like to meet and associate with people who agree with us. That's human nature. But oftentimes the people, uh, some people that you uh, associate with who agree with you and who are very nice and lovely uh, uh, come to the point where they t can take advantage of you, and they do. Now, um, Information is abundant, most of it is free, but facts have an elusive habit and generally there is a price attached to them. Certainly the price is painstaking labor in examining them for accuracy. That's the least of the price that you have to pay for facts. And this question, how do you know, is the favorite question of the thinker. When a, when a thinker has a statement, here's a statement uh, uh, that he doesn't, uh, that he can't accept, Immediately, he says to the, uh, to the speaker, how do you know what is your source of information? This business of asking people to identify their source of knowledge. And uh, when, uh, oftentimes, if you have the slightest doubt, if you do that, you put the person right out on a limb. He won't be able to do it. 
Or if you ask him how he knows, he'll tell you, well, I believe so. Well, now what how right of you to believe anything unless you it's based upon something, unless you can give some background for it? I believe there's a God. A lot of people do. But I'll bet you there are a lot of people who say that they believe in the God who couldn't give you the slightest evidence of him if you backed them into a corner. I can give you evidence. When I say that I believe in a God and you say, how do you know? I can give you all of the evidence. Of, I don't know. I don't have so much evidence in connection with anything else in this world as I do in connection with the existence of a creator. Because the order and this is of this universe couldn't go on and on eons and eons of times ad infinitum without a first cause and without a plan back of it. You know that's absolutely true. And yet there are a lot of people who undertake to prove the presence of God in a devious ways that uh, from in my book of rules wouldn't be evidence at all. Anything that exists, including God, is capable of proof. And where there is no such proof, Available, it is safe to assume that nothing exists. Now, when no facts are available for the basis of an opinion or a judgment or a plan, turn to, the, to logic for guidance. No one has ever seen God, but logic says that he exists of necessity. He has to exist, or we wouldn't be here. We couldn't be here without a first cause, a higher intelligence than ourselves. We couldn't be here. And that thing called logic, it's a wonderful thing. You know, there are times when you have a hunch, you have a feeling that certain things are true or certain things are not true. And you better be careful to pay high respect to that hunch or those feelings. Because that's a, that's a probably infinite intelligence trying to break through the outer shell and to let you use a little logic. If one of you got up and said, now my definite major aim is to... Uh, make a million dollars this coming year. Well, what, do you say, what would I say if you did that? What would be the question, first question I would ask you, do you think? How do you do it? Yeah, how? How are you going to do it? I want to hear your plan. And then after I hear your plan, um, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to accept it or reject it? What am I going to do about it? I'm going to weigh you, first of all, your ability to uh, get a million dollars and to find out what you're going to give for it, and then I'm go my logic will tell me whether or not your plan for doing it is probable uh, and uh, workable and practical. Now, that doesn't take an awful lot of intelligent thinking, but it's a very important thing to do. And I'd go over it, I'd analyze your plan, I'd analyze you, I'd analyze your capabilities, I'd analyze your past experience, your past achievements, I'd analyze the people that you're going to help uh, get to help you make that million dollars. And when we got through analyzing, I would be able to tell you that, well, probably you can do it. But, or I'd be able to point out to you that probably it'll take longer than the year that you said. Maybe it'll take two years, maybe it'll take three. And then again, probably I might tell you that you wouldn't be able to do it at all. If my reasoning taught me that that was, what, uh, that was the answer, well, I'd give it to you just that way. I've had some of my students, some of them sitting right here in this room, come out and put propositions before me, which I had to turn down and tell them to just absolutely forget about it, because they're wasting their time. Now, that's the way an accurate thinker proceeds. He doesn't allow his emotions to run away with him. If I allowed my emotions to do my thinking for me, I would, uh, anything that one of my students undertook to do, I'd tell him he could do it. <laughs> This famous motto or epigram that you've seen quoted a lot of times, you've heard it in my lessons, whatever your mind can conceive and believe, your mind can achieve. I don't want anybody to misread that statement this way by saying, reading into it, whatever your mind can conceive and believe, your mind will achieve. I said it can achieve. Do you get the line of difference there between the two? It can, uh, but uh, I don't know that it will. That's, that's up to you. Only you know that. The extent to which you use your own mind, the extent to which you intensify your faith, the soundness of your judgments and your plans, all will be factors entering into how well you carry out that aphorism or that epigram. Whatever your mind can conceive and believe, your mind can can achieve. 
Semantic tests now to be made and separated in facts from information. Let's see how we go about it. First of all, scrutinize with unusual care everything you read in newspapers or hear over the radio and form the habit of never accepting any statement as a fact merely because you read it or heard it expressed by someone. Statements uh, bearing some proportion of fact often are intentionally or carelessly colored to give them an erroneous meaning. A half-truth, in other words, is, as uh, someone has said, is more dangerous than an out-and-out lie. It's more dangerous because that half-truth part is liable to deceive somebody who knows that it's a, uh, who understands half of it and thinks the whole of it is true. Scrutinize carefully everything you read in books, regardless of who wrote them, and never accept the works of any writer without asking the following questions and satisfying yourself as to the answers. And that would reply, apply to lectures or statements or speeches or conversations or anything else. These rules that I'm going to give you. First of all, is the writer a recognized authority on the subject covered? The writer or the speaker or the teacher or the one that's making the statement. Is he a recognized authority on the subject on which he's speaking or writing? That's the first question that you ask. Next, did the writer or the speaker have an ulterior or a self-interest motive other than that of imparting accurate information? You know, the motive that prompts a man to write a book or to make a speech or to make a statement in public or in private conversation. The motive back of it is very important. And if you can get out a man's motive when he's talking, you can tell pretty well how truthful he is in what he's saying. Has the writer a profit interest or other interest in the subject on which he writes or speaks? You know, that when you find out what a man's motive is, when whatever he's doing, if you can locate his motive in doing it, it'll be impossible for him to fool you in the least because you'll be able to smell him out. And is the writer a person of sound judgment and uh, not a fanatic on the subject on which he writes? I have seen a lot of people who are overzealous about uh, to the point of fanaticism. If you wanted to judge me, for instance, you wouldn't judge me on account of the kind of a tie I wear, the kind of a suit I wear, or how I cut my hair, or how I used to cut my hair. <laughs> <laughs> And how well I speak, or how poorly I speak, you wouldn't judge me by any of those things. You'd judge me by how much influence I'm having for good or evil on people. That's the way you would judge me. That's the way you would judge anybody else. You might not like a man's brand of religion or politics. But if he's, uh, if he's, re if he's doing a good job in his field and helping a lot of people and doing no damage, never mind about his brand. Don't condemn him if he's doing more good than he is harm, preponderantly more good than harm. Before accepting as facts statements by others, ascertain the motive which prompted the statements. Ascertain also the writer's reputation for truth and veracity. And scrutinize with unusual care all statements made by people who have strong motives or objectives they desire to attain through their statements. And be equally careful about accepting as facts the statements of overzealous people who have the habit of allowing their imaginations to run wild. <coughs> Learn to be cautious um, and to use your own judgment no matter who is trying to influence you. Use your own judgment in final analysis. And uh, what do you do if you can't trust your own judgment? Is there an answer in this philosophy for that? There certainly is. There certainly most definitely is an answer. And you know, there are a lot of times when an individual can't trust his own judgment because he doesn't know enough about the circumstances that he's faced with. He's got to turn to somebody with broader experience or a different education or a keener uh, mind for analysis. He has got to do that. For instance, uh, uh, can you imagine a business succeeding who was made all made up of master salesmen? Can you imagine that? Did you ever know such a business? Yeah. I have. You'd think, why, that's wonderful. Master salesmen, why, they'll go out and bring in all the business in the world. Why, sure they do, and then spend all the money in the world, too, in doing it. You need a wet blanket man in every organization, and you need a hatchet man. <laughs> a man will cut through the red tape and everything else that gets in his way, and let the chips fall wherever they may. I wouldn't want to be a hatchet man, I wouldn't want to be a wet blanket man, but certainly I'd want one in my, uh, those two in my organization if my operation was very extensive. 
In seeking facts from others, do not disclose to them what facts you expect to find. Now, why is that, why do, why is that statement made? If I say to you, uh, by the way, you uh, used to employ uh, John Brown, and uh, he's applied to me for a position. I think he's a wonderful man. What do you think? <laughs> well, if he has any faults, I'll certainly not get them with that kind of a question, will I? If I really wanted to find out about John Brown, who used to work for you, how would I go about getting the information? Well, I wouldn't go about getting it from you at all in the first place. I'd uh, have the, the commercial credit company to get an unbiased report on from you. And you'd probably give out the facts to the credit rating company that you wouldn't give out to me or to anybody else. Surprising how much information you can get if you know the right to, uh, commercial agency through which to get it. But oftentimes when you go direct for information about a man, unless it's very friendly and favorable, the chances are you won't get the real facts. You'll get a varnished or a watered down set of facts, don't you know? No, if you're going to, if you ask a man a question and you give him the slightest idea as to what you expect the answer to be, uh, most people are lazy anyway. They don't want to go to too much trouble in explaining. But, well, they'll just uh, give you the answer they know you want and you're tickled to death and you go on with it and then fall down on it later on. Science is the uh, art of organizing and classifying facts. That's what science means. And when you wish to make sure you are dealing with facts, seek scientific sources for their testing where possible. The men of science have neither the reason nor the inclination to modify or to change facts nor to misrepresent. Isn't that an astounding thing? They just don't have the reason. Well, if they did, if they had that inclination, they would not be scientists, would they? They'd be pseudo-scientists or fakes. And there are a lot of pseudo-scientists and fakes in this world, believe you me, who assume to know things that they don't know. And your emotions are not always reliable. As a matter of fact, they, most of the time they're not reliable. And before being influenced too far by your feelings, give your head a chance to pass judgment on the business at hand. The head is more dependable than the heart, but uh, what makes a good combination? Balancing them, and that's the idea, just balancing them, so that both of them have an equal say, so to speak, and you'll come put it here coming up with the right answer if you do that. The person who forgets this generally regrets his neglect. Now, these are some of the major enemies of sound thinking. The emotion of love, for instance, stands right up at the head of the list. You'd think, why, how in the world could the emotion of love interfere with anybody's thinking? Yeah, yeah. If you said that, I'd know right away you hadn't had very many love experiences. If you've ever had an experience with love at all, you know very well how dangerous it is. It's like playing around TNT with a match in your hand. When it starts... <laughs> When it starts exploding, it doesn't give any notice. <laughs> then hatred and anger and jealousy and fear and revenge and greed and vanity and egotism and the desire for something for nothing and procrastination. All of these are enemies of thinking. You have to be on the lookout for them constantly and to be sure that you're free of them. Provided that the thinking at hand is of importance to you and maybe your whole future destiny depends upon your thinking accurately. And isn't it the fact that it does? Doesn't your future destiny depend very largely on your accuracy or your lack of it in your thinking? Of course, if that were not true, then what would be the use of the Creator having given you complete control of your own mind? What, what, what good would it be? The answer is that that mind is sufficient unto all of your needs, absolutely, at least on this uh, lifespan. I don't know on the, uh, on the preceding plane where you came from or on the succeeding plane where you're going to. I don't know about those planes because I don't remember where I came from and I don't yet know where I'm going. <laughs> I wish I did. But I know a great deal about where I am now. And I found out a great deal about how to influence my destiny here now so that I get a lot of pleasure out of it, so I get joy, so I give joy, so I make myself useful and I justify my having passed this way. Why do I, can I say that? Because I have discovered how to manipulate my own mind and keep it under control, make it do the things I want it to do, throw off the circumstances I don't want and accept the ones that I do want, and if I don't find the circumstances I want, what do I do? Create them, of course, create them. That's what definiteness of purpose and imagination are for.
Now, um, your mind uh, should be an eternal question mark. Question everything and everyone until you satisfy yourself that you are dealing with facts. Do this quietly in the silence of your own mind and avoid being known as a doubting Thomas. Don't come out and uh, question people orally. That's not going to get you anywhere. And, uh, but uh, question them silently. And furthermore, if you're too outspoken and too oral about your questioning of people, it puts them on notice and they cover up and you don't get the information you want. Quietly go about seeking for information and doing some accurate thinking. You probably will come up with it. Be a good listener, but also be an accurate thinker as you listen. Which is most uh, profitable, to be a good speaker or a good, thi a good listener? <laughs> Why? You can make a balance as to what they say. I don't know of any virtue or any quality that would be, that will help an individual to get along in this world better than to be an effective, enthusiastic speaker. I just don't know of any other quality that, that will excel at them. And yet, I would follow that statement immediately by saying that it's far more profitable to anybody to be a good listener, an analytical <laughs> listener, than it is to be a good speaker. Let your mind be an eternal question mark. Now, I don't mean by that that you should uh, be become a cynic, nor a doubting Thomas, but I mean that, I mean that no matter who you're dealing with, deal with them on the basis of thinking accurately of every relationship that you have. You'll get a lot of satisfaction out of that. You'll also be more successful. And if you're tactful as you go along and diplomatic, you'll uh, have a lot more uh, substantial friends than you have by the old method of uh, snap judgment. Mostly your friends, if you're an accurate thinker, mostly your friends will be friends worth having. Believe you me, they will. Your thinking habits are the results of social heredity and physical heredity. Watch both of these sources carefully, but particularly social heredity. Now, physical heredity, through physical heredity, you get everything that you are physically. The stature of your body, the shape of the texture of your skin, color of your eyes and hair, and you're the sum total of all of your ancestors, back farther than you can ever remember or think. And uh, you inherited a little of their good qualities and a little of their bad. And there's nothing you can do about that. That's static. It's fixed at birth. But by far the most important part of what you are is a result of your social heredity, that is your environmental influences, the things that you have allowed to go into your mind and that you've accepted as a part of your character. That's the important thing. Down at the bottom, your conscience was given to you as a guide when all other sources of knowledge and facts have been exhausted. Be careful to use it as a guide and not as a conspirator. Did you, do you know a lot of people who use their consciences as a conspirator instead of a guide? In other words, they, they so sell their conscience on the idea that what they're doing is right, that the, uh, the conscience falls in line eventually and becomes a conspirator. Now then, if you sincerely wish to think accurate, there is a price that you must pay for this ability, a price which is uh, not measurable in money. And first, you must learn to examine carefully all of your emotional feelings by submitting them to your sense of reason. That's step number one in accurate thinking. In other words, the things that you like to do best are the things that you should examine most and first to make sure that the if they lead you to the attainment of some object, that you want that object after you get it. The point I'm making is that the thing that you set your heart upon, be careful about the thing that you set your heart upon, because uh, when you get it, sometimes you find out it's not what you wanted at all. Now, I could multiply that by a thousand illustrations of men who paid too much for what they got, who wanted something too badly, who tried to get too much of it, did get too much of it, but didn't get peace of mind and balancing of their lives along with it. I, I think the saddest thing that ever came out of my... Uh, research in building this philosophy was the things that I learned about the men, the wealthy men that collaborated in the building of this philosophy. The fact that they didn't get success along with their money. It's to me a sad thing indeed. They didn't get success because they became too obsessed with the importance of money and power and the, money, the power that money would give them. And you must curb the habit of expressing opinions which are not based upon facts or what you believe to be fact. Did you know that you didn't have a right to an opinion about anything, not anything at all, unless you uh, base it upon facts or what you believe to be facts? 
I'll bet you wouldn't admit that that's true. I'll bet you won't admit that that's true, that you have no right whatsoever to have an opinion about anything at any time unless it's based upon what you believe to be facts or actual provable facts. Now why do I say you don't have a right to it? Because it is dangerous for you to have, you, you can do it, I mean you have a right of course, but I mean to say you have the responsibility of assuming what happens to you if you express an opinion that's not based upon facts or what you believe to be facts. You can fool yourself that way and a lot of people go all the way through life fooling themselves by uh, opinions that have no basis for existence. You must master the habit of being influenced by people in any manner whatsoever merely because you like them or they are related to you or they may have done you a favor. Now I know that when you've gone the extra mile you're going to put a lot of people under obligations to you and I want you to do that. That's perfectly proper. That's legitimate to put people under obligations to you by helping people. Now that says that nobody can find any fault with that. But be careful. Be careful in being influenced by people just because they have done you a favor. I'm talking now to the people for whom you've gone the extra mile. And you may be in that position sometimes too. Or somebody puts you under obligations to an extent that you don't want to be put under obligations. Uh, you must form the habit of examining the motives of people who seek some benefit from or through your influence. You must control both your emotion of love and your emotion of hate in, asking, in making decisions for any purpose because either of these can unbalance your thinking habits. No man ought to make an important decision while he's angry. You just, you just shouldn't do it. And correcting children, for instance, it's a bad mistake to discipline children when you're, when you're angry. Because you're nine times out of ten, you'll do and say the wrong thing. Do more harm than good. And that applies to a lot of grown-ups, too. If you're really angry, don't make decisions, don't make statements to people while you're mad. Because they can come back on you and do you an awful lot of in injury. Uh, self-control or self-discipline. You see, we have a lesson on self-discipline, you remember? It plays right along with this lesson, doesn't it? Because a lot of times when if you're going to be an active thinker, you've got to have a lot of self-discipline. You've got to refrain from saying and doing a lot of things you'd like to say and do. Bide your time. There's always a time for you to do everything. Time your, uh, what you say and do properly. And uh, you, uh, accurate thinkers do that too. They don't just fly off the handle and say they start their mouths to going and go, on, or go off and leave them like some people do. They carefully study the effect on the listener of every word they utter even before they utter it. Don't make any decisions or plans until you have carefully weighed what the effect may be on you and on other people. I can think of a lot of things I could do that would benefit me that wouldn't benefit you. Might even injure you. I can think of a lot of things. But I wouldn't engage in them because eventually I'd have to pay the price. Because whatever you do to or for another person, you do to or for yourself. It comes back to you. Greatly multiply. That's another thing that comes under the heading of accurate thinking. You learn very... Uh, after you've uh, become thoroughly indoctrinated with this philosophy, you learn not to do anything that you don't want to come back and affect you. Not to think anything, not to say anything, not to do anything that you don't want to come back and that you have to give countenance to later on in life. You must recognize that before accepting as facts the statements of other people, it may be beneficial if you ask them how they came by the so-called facts. And when they express opinions, ask how you know your opinion is sound. Uh, I don't want an opinion, I want some facts. Then I'll, I'll form my own opinion. You give me the facts and I'll put them together in my own way, says the accurate thinker. You must learn to examine with extraordinary care all statements of a derogatory nature made by one person against others. Because the very nature of such statements brands them as being not without bias. And that's putting it very politely. You must uh, overcome the habit of trying to justify a decision you have made which turns out to have been unsound. Accurate thinkers just don't do that. 
They reverse themselves just as quickly as they make the decisions if they find they're wrong. Alibis and accurate thinking never are friendly bedfellows. Excuses and alibis and accurate thinking are not friendly bedfellows. I've never seen the person yet that wasn't very adept at creating alibis for his faults and the things that he didn't do that he should have done, the things that should, they didn't do that he shouldn't have done. In other words, uh, most people have a great stock of them and you don't have to give them very much time before they can fling them together and uh, spray, throw them at you. Good excuses, good alibis that they don't mount to a thing unless there's something back of them that's sound that you can depend upon. If you are an accurate thinker, you will never use the term they say or I heard. Or accurate thinkers in repeating things they have heard first identify the source and attempt to establish its dependability. You know, uh, folks, it's not an easy matter to be an accurate thinker. I, I, have you reached that conclusion already? That's quite a little bit you have to pay in order to have it, but it's worth it, isn't it? It's worth trying. If you're not an accurate thinker, you're, the people are going to take advantage of you. You're not going to get much out of life like you'd like to. You're not going to be satisfied. You'll never be a well-balanced person without accurate thinking. And in order to think accurately, you've got to have a set of rules to go by. And you'll find in this lesson, if you'll go over this lesson and study it carefully, add some notes to it of your own, start now to do some thinking, start to putting into practice tomorrow morning or before that time some of these uh, principles of separating facts from information and separating the facts themselves into two classes, important and unimportant. You just make those four steps alone. This lesson will very much more than have justified yourself, and this lesson alone could well be worth a thousand times as much as, as you have put into the entire course if it teaches you just to do those simple things, to start separating facts from information. Be sure that you're dealing with facts, and then take the facts after you're dealing with them and break them down and throw off the unimportant facts that you've been wasting so much time with heretofore. If there is uh, one thing in uh, the world that people do not like, it's to undergo adversity and unpleasant circumstances and defeat. And yet, uh, if I have uh, evaluated circumstances properly, and if I have taken inventory of the laws of nature properly, it was intended that we all should undergo adversities, defeat, failure, opposition. I still say that uh, people do not like defeat, they do not like adversity, and yet I'm compelled to tell you that had it not been for the adversities that I went through during the early part of my life, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you tonight. I wouldn't have completed this philosophy. I wouldn't be reaching millions of people all over the world because it was out of the opposition that I met with, that I grew the strength and the wisdom and the ability to complete this philosophy and to take it to the people in the shape that it's now in. Yet if I were to go back over the past and had my choice, I have no doubt that I'd make it easier for myself, just the same as you would from here on out. We're all inclined to do that, to find the uh, line of least resistance. Did you know that taking the line of least resistance is what makes all rivers and some men crooked? <laughs> That's right. Yet it's a very common habit for us to do that. We don't want to pay the price of uh, intense effort, no matter what we're doing. We like to have things come the easy way. And the mind is just like any other part, of, like a, any part of the physical body. It uh, atrophies and withers away and becomes weak through disuse. When you uh, are met with, uh, when you meet with problems, circumstances and incidents that force you to do thinking, why, probably that is the finest thing that could happen to you. Because without a motive, you're not going to do very much thinking anyway. There are 40 major reasons or causes of failure. More than twice as many causes of failure as there are principles of success. There are 17 principles of success, some combination of which is responsible for all successful achievements and more than 40 major causes of failure. And uh, that is not all of them. These are just the major causes. Now, uh, self-examination is one of the most uh, profitable things that you can indulge in. And sometimes uh, you don't want to do it, but it's a very necessary thing for us to know ourselves as we are, especially our weaknesses. 
In uh, putting out a philosophy of success, it is necessary to tell you the things that you should do in order to succeed and also the things you should not do. Grade yourself as I go along as I make comment on each one of them. Uh, grade yourself from zero to 100, meaning if you're 100% free of any one of them, grade yourself 100%. If you're only 50% free, grade yourself 50%. And if you uh, aren't free at all, <laughs> grade yourself zero. And when you get through, add the total up and divide it by 40, and you'll get your general average then on the control of the things that cause men and women to fail. First of all, on the habit of drifting with circumstances without definite aims or plans. Now, if you don't uh, follow that habit of drifting, if you make decisions quickly, if you lay out plans and follow those plans, if you know exactly where you're going and are on the way, you can grade yourself 100% on that one. But uh, be careful before you put down the grading, because it's the rarest thing in the world that anybody would be able to grade himself 100% on that one. You really have to be organized and you really have to be prepared if you're going to do that. Number two, unfavorable physical heredity, uh, hereditary foundation at birth. Well, I don't need to make any comment on that. As a matter of fact, that uh, can be or could be a cause of failure. Also, it could be a cause of success. Some of the most successful people I have ever known were handicapped by bad afflictions at birth. And number three, meddlesome curiosity in connection with other people's business and affairs. Meddlesome curiosity. Now, curiosity is a wonderful thing. If we weren't curious, we'd never learn anything. We'd never investigate. But notice the wording of that, meddlesome curiosity with other people's affairs, something that doesn't really concern you. Of course, none of you would be uh, guilty of that, so you'll grade yourself 100% on that. Or will you? Now, remember, as you uh, grade yourself, go back in your past experiences and determine to what extent you have control of these weaknesses. Number four, lack of a definite major purpose as a lifetime goal. You've been, uh, we've been talking about that one for a long time about having it, now we're putting down the lack of it. If you, if you lack it, here's a mighty good place to rate yourself zero. Five, inadequate schooling. Well, uh, you know one of the most astounding things that I have learned from life is to discover the, uh, that there is very little relationship between schooling and success. Oh, I hesitated there for purpose, not because I didn't have something else to say and couldn't remember my lines, but I wanted you to think about that one. Some of the most successful people I have ha ever known have been people with the least amount of formal education, formal schooling. A lot of people go through life failures and they alibi themselves out of it, kid themselves into believing that they're failures because they don't have a college education. If you come out of college with the feeling that you should be paid for what you know instead of what you do, then that uh, college education hasn't done you much good until you meet that old man destiny that's standing just around the corner where you're going to pass with a stuffed club. And it's not stuffed with cotton. You'll find out sooner or later that you're not going to be paid for what you know. You're going to be paid for what you uh, do with what you know or what you can get other people to do. Number six, lack of self-discipline, generally uh, manifesting itself by excesses in eating, drinking, and indifference toward opportunities for self-advancement and improvement. Lack of self-discipline. I hope you can grade yourselves very high on that one. Number seven, lack of ambition to aim above mediocrity. There's a humdinger. Just how much ambition do you have? Anyway, where are you going in life? What do you want out of life? What are you going to settle for? I told you the story some time ago of a young soldier that came in just after World War Number One wanted to settle for a sandwich and a place to sleep that night. I wouldn't let him do it. I talked him into uh, settling for a higher rate than that, with the result that he became a multimillionaire within the, within the following four years. I hope I'll have as much success with you in stepping your ambition up to where you're not willing to settle uh, with life for a penny. Aim high. It's not going to cost you anything to aim high. You may not get as far as you aim, but you'll certainly get farther than you would if you don't aim at all. Get your sights raised up. Be ambitious. Be determined that you're going to 
become in the future what you uh, have failed to become in the past. And number eight, ill health, often due to wrong thinking and improper diet. There's a lot of alibis on the count of ill health, too, I can assure you. A lot of an imag imaginary ailments. Well, they call it hypochondria in the Materia Medica. I don't know to what extent you've been coddling yourselves or babying yourselves on with this, that, and the other imaginary ailment, but if you have been doing that, why, well, grade yourself down pretty low on that one. Number uh, nine, unfavorable environmental influences during childhood. Now, once in a great while, you will find that the influences of, uh, upon a person during childhood are of such a negative nature that they go all the way through life with those negative influences. I'm quite convinced that if I had been uh, permitted to continue in my childhood as I started out before my stepmother came into the picture, that I really and truly would have become a second Jesse James, only I would have been able to shoot faster and straighter than he did. Well, <clears throat> number 10, lack of persistence in following through with one's duties. Lack of There's a honey. Lack of persistence in following through with one's duty. Uh, what is it that causes people to uh, fail to follow through when they start something? What, what's the main reason why people do not follow through and do the thing right and to see it's done right? Lack of motive. That's the idea. They don't want to do it badly enough. Believe you me, I'll follow through on anything that I want to follow through on, but if I don't want to follow through, I can find a lot of alibis to keep from doing it. Is it uh, profitable for you to get into the habit of following through when you undertake something, or is it profitable for you to uh, be, uh, permit yourself to be sidetracked? Well, all right, let's put the question another way. How do you rate on that one? <laughs> That's the important thing. How do you rate on that one? Do you follow through, or are you easily sidetracked? Are you easily dissuaded from doing a thing when somebody criticizes you? Believe you me, uh, uh, if I had uh, been afraid of criticism, I never would have gotten anywhere in life. I, I got to the point eventually at which I really accorded criticism because it only put the fight in me. And uh, I found out that when that fight was in me, I did a much better job and I carried through better. There are a lot of people in this world who fail because uh, they lack that uh, driving force, don't you know, that causes them to, to carry through. And especially when the going is hard. No matter what you're doing, you're going to run into uh, that period when the going is hard. If it's a new business, you'll uh, probably need finances that you don't have in the beginning. Or if it's a profession, you'll need clients that you don't have in the beginning. Or if it's a new job, uh, you'll need uh, recognition with your employer that you don't have. You have to earn that recognition. The going is always hard with people in the beginning, and that's why you need this follow-through. Number 11, the habit of... Uh, a negative mental attitude, the habit of keeping your mind negative all the time. Now, uh, which are you? Preponderantly negative most of the time, or are you preponderantly positive? When you see a donut, what do you see first? Do you see the hole first, or the donut? Well, <laughs> that's fine. You know, when you go to eat a donut, you don't eat the hole, do you? You just eat the donut. But there are a lot of people who, uh, when they come across a problem, they, uh, they uh, are like the fellow who sees the hole in the donut and growls about it because it took so much of the nice cake out, but do not see the, the donut itself. Negative mental attitude. Uh, what is the result of a person who uh, has the habit of uh, allowing his mind to become negative and remain negative? What, what, what happens to that kind of a person? You can't put him in jail for it. You can't sue him for it. A negative mind repels, doesn't it? It repels people. A positive mind attracts. Attracts what? People who harmonize with your mental attitude, your character. I don't saying of birds of a feather flock together. Well, negative birds flock to the negative mind and neg positive birds flock to the positive mind. Uh, who has control over your mind? Uh, who, who determines whether it's positive or negative? You. Now then, there's where I want you to grade yourself, oh, on the extent to which you exercise that prerogative. And that's the most precious thing that you have on the face of this earth or ever will have. It's the only thing that you have that you have 
complete, unchallenged, and unchallengeable, unchallengeable control over. It is the right to make your mind positive and keep it that way, or make it negative, allow the circumstances of life to make it negative. And you have to work at it if you're going to keep your mind positive, because, uh, for, for what reason? That's right. So much negative influences around you. So many people, so many circumstances that are negative that if you're going to become a part of those instead of creating your own circumstances in your mind, then most of the time you'll be negative. Do you have a very, very clear concept of what, what the difference is between a negative mind and a positive mind? Can you picture the, what happens in the chemistry of the brain when your mind is positive and when it's negative? Have you ever demonstrated or, or experienced in your own life uh, the differences between uh, your achievements when you are afraid and the achievements when you're not afraid? You have. Like in selling or like in doing anything else, in teaching or in lecturing or in writing or anything else. When I first wrote uh, Think and Grow Rich, I wrote it while I was working for President Roosevelt during that uh, bad depression during his first term. And I wrote it in that same negative mental attitude that everybody else was in. In other words, it was forced upon me unconsciously. <coughs> Several years later, when I got that book out and read it, I recognized it was not a saleable book because of the tempo of it being negative. And you could pick that up. A reader will pick up exactly the mental attitude that a writer is in when he writes a book, no matter what kind of language or terminology he uses. So, I sat down to my typewriter, I didn't change a word in that book, I sat down to my typewriter when I was in a new frame of mind, on, up on the beam as we say, 100% positive, and I typed that book in that frame of mind, and that's the thing that made that book click. You can't afford to do anything when you're negative. Anything that you expect to benefit you. Anything that you expect to influence other people. If you want to get people to cooperate with you, or to, if you want to sell people something, or if you want to make a good impression upon people, don't come near them until you're in a positive frame of mind. Now, the reason I have emphasized that so much, I want to give you a chance to grade yourself accurately on that one. And in doing that, you will, uh, you will grade yourself on the average state of mind that you maintain, not just on the state of mind at any given time for a short time. I'll tell you a good rule to go by which will enable you to determine very, to a large extent whether or not you are more positive than you are negative. Would you like to have that rule? Yeah. Observe how you feel when you wake up in the morning and start to get out, <laughs> out of bed. And if you're not in a good frame of mind then, I'll tell you right now, it's because of a lot of thought habits that have preceded that uh, hour, the day before perhaps, that have been negative. You can make yourself very ill by allowing your mind to become negative and it will reflect itself the next morning in particular. You see, when you come out of sleep, you're just uh, fresh from coming out of, from under the influence of your subconscious mind. Your, sub, your conscious mind has been off duty and it goes back on duty and it finds a mess there that you've got to clean up, <laughs> that the subconscious mind has been stirring up all night long. But if you wake up full of joy and uh, you want to get out and uh, get out what you're going to do today, well, the chances are that you've been pretty positive the day before, and maybe several days before. <coughs>
like people who inherited it, for instance. <clears throat> Did you ever, would you be interested in knowing how, why, why they call me Napoleon? Would you, would you be interested in knowing? <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you because it makes a good point here. My father named me, my, I being the, old, the eldest son, or the first child, my father named me after my great uncle, Napoleon Hill of Memphis, Tennessee, who was a multimillionaire cotton broker, hoping that when Uncle Napoleon died that I would get some of the money. Well, he died, and I didn't get any of the money. And when I found out that I was not going to get any of it, I felt very badly. But uh, later on, as I swapped some of my youth for wisdom and observed what happened to the ones who did get it, I was thankful, eternally grateful that I didn't get a dime of it, because I learned a better way of getting it for myself without having it given to me. Well, number 13, the desire for something for nothing. Are you ever troubled with that? The desire for something for nothing or the desire for something for less than its value, the desire for something without uh, being willing to give adequate uh, compensation for it. Are you ever troubled with that uh, tendency? Well, now, who of us hasn't been at one time or another? I'd like to ask. But after all, you can have a lot of faults, but uh, what you want to do is to find out what they are and start getting rid of them. That's why we're making this analysis. We're giving you a chance to come face to face and to uh, be trial judge, be defendant, and be prosecutor all at one time, and then you make the decision finally. And if you make it accurately, it'd be far better for you to find, the, uh, find your faults than it would be for me to find them for you. Because if you find them, you're not going to spin any alibis, you're going to try to get rid of them. And number 14, lack of the habit of reaching decisions promptly and firmly. Now, do you reach decisions promptly and firmly? Or do you reach decisions uh, uh, very slowly and after you reach them, uh, do you allow the first person that comes along to uh, reverse you? Or do you allow circumstances to reverse your decision without a sound reason? To what extent do you stand by your decisions after you make them? Just under what circumstances would you reverse the decisions you'd made, incidentally? That's right, and uh, you should hold an open mind on that subject at all times. You should never make a decision uh, and say, that's, uh, that's it, and I'm going to stand by it forever because there might be something developed later on that would prompt you to, uh, to reverse that decision. And you know there are some people who are known as stubborn, who when once they've made a decision, right or wrong, they die by it. <laughs> I, I've seen people like that, a lot of them, who would just rather die than to reverse themselves or have somebody reverse them on a decision. Of course, you're not like that. That is, if you're really indoctrinated with this philosophy, you, you may be, have been like that once, but you're not like that now, or you're not going to be like that paper tonight. Number 15, one or more of the seven basic fears. And I'm not going to dwell on them because there are the seven basic fears, and you can grade yourself on that one at, at your leisure. You know, this is a wonderful world we're living in, a wonderful life. I, I am glad I'm here. I'm glad I'm doing just what I am. And if uh, unpleasant circumstances cross my path, I'm very glad for that too, because uh, I'll find out whether I'm stronger than the circumstances or not. And as long as I can conquer them and go over them, I'm not going to worry about circumstances, about things that oppose me, people that don't like me, people that talk, say mean things about me. I don't worry about that. What I would worry about would be if people said mean things about me and I'd examine myself and found out they were telling the truth. <laughs> But as long as they're not telling the truth, uh, well, I can stand back and laugh at them, uh, how foolish they are and how much damage they're doing themselves. Now here's a honey, number 16, the wrong selection of a mate in marriage. Now don't, <laughs> don't uh, be too uh, quick to grade yourself on that one. <laughs> if you've made, your, uh, made a hundred percent mistake on that, look around before you grade yourself and see if you can't do something about correcting that mistake. Maybe resell yourself. I've known all that being done too, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, you know there's some people who believe that all marriages are made in heaven. 
Well, it would be a wonderful thing if they were, but I've seen some that were not made in heaven. I don't know where else they might have been made, but they certainly weren't made in heaven. Also, I've seen some business marriages, some business relationships that were not made in heaven. I've helped to correct a lot of those, believe you me. Business associates that were not working together in a spirit of harmony. And there's no business on the face of this earth that can succeed unless the people at the top level at least are working in harmony. And there's no household, there's no household or home that can be a joy, a place that you want to go to but worse than you want to come away from it unless there is harmony at the top. And that harmony starts with, lo with loyalty. Loyalty and dependability. And then would come ability after that. That's the way I would evaluate people. If I wanted to select a man or a woman for a high position, the first thing I would look for is to see whether that person was loyal to the people to whom he owed loyalty. If he didn't have loyalty, I wouldn't want him or her on any terms whatsoever. The next thing I would look for would be dependability. Whether or not you can depend upon him to be at the right place at the right time and to do the right thing. And then after that would come ability. I've seen a lot of people who had great ability, but they had, were not dependable, and they were not loyal, and therefore very dangerous. Number 17, overcaution in business and professional relationships. Have you seen people so, so cautious that they wouldn't trust, trust their own mother-in-law? <laughs> sure you have. <laughs> <clears throat> I knew a man who was so cautious once that he had a, had a special wallet made and a little lock put on it and he hid the key in a different place every night so that his wife couldn't go through his trousers and take money out of his wallet. <laughs> Wasn't he a honey? I bet his wife loved him. Overcaution in business and professional relationships, then lack of all forms of caution in all human relationships. Have you seen people like that that just didn't have any caution? People who start their mouths to going and go off and leave them, never mind what they're going to say or what the effects are going to have on other people. You've seen people like that, haven't you? No caution whatsoever, no discrimination, no diplomacy, no uh, consideration of what they're going to do to other people through their words. I've seen people with tongues that were sharper than a double-edged uh, Gillette blade that never had been used. And they start them to cutting and go out, just walk away and leave them. No caution whatsoever. I've seen people who would sign anything that a salesman put in front of them without even reading it. They wouldn't need to read the big type, let alone the little type. Have you seen people like that? Of course, you're not like that. But you know you can be overcautious and you can be undercautious. What is the happy medium? The happy medium is found in, lesson, uh, in the lesson on accurate thinking, where you examine carefully the things that you're going to do before you do them, not afterward. Where you evaluate your words before you express them, not afterward. Now, you know it's going to be a little bit difficult for you to grade yourselves accurately on this one. I know it is. To be perfectly candid with you, it would be a, a little bit difficult for me to grade myself accurately on those two, on 17 and 18, because there have been a lot of times in my life when I wasn't uh, cautious at all. I think most of my troubles in my early days came through my trusting too many people. I let somebody come along and flatter me into using the name Napoleon Hill, and he'd go out and flim flam a lot of people in the name of Napoleon Hill. That's happened several times in my life before I tightened up and became cautious. And that can happen to a lot of people, you know. But on the other hand, I wouldn't want to become so cautious that I didn't trust anybody for anything. you get no joy out of living if you did that. Number 21, lack of concentration of effort. That is divided interest. You, do, you split your interest. Divide them over a lot of, your interest over a lot of different things. You know, one person is not strong enough and life is too short to ensure your success unless you learn the art of concentrating everything you've got on one thing at a time and following through on that one thing and doing a good job. And now here is one that's uh, going to be difficult for you to grade yourself on perhaps. Uh, number 22, lack of a budget control over income and expenditures. Having a systematic way of taking care of your income and your expenditures. Do you know how the average person uh, manages that uh, question of a budget? Well, I, he, he, over his expenditures, he, uh, that is somewhat controlled by the amount of credit that he can get from other people. That's about the only thing. 
when the credit shuts down on him, then he more or less slacks off. But until that happens, why he runs wild with spending. A good business firm would uh, go bankrupt in a little while if it didn't have a system of control over its income and ex its expenditures. That's what a controller in an organization is for. They call him a wet blanket usually. Every, every successful business of any size has to have a wet blanket. A man who controls uh, the assets of the company, keeps them from getting away in the wrong, at the wrong time in the wrong way. And number 24, that's right, you're following me, 23 is right. The failure to budget and use time to best advantage. Now that is the most precious thing that you have. You have 24 hours every day, eight hours of that you must devote to sleep if you're going to have health, or, or, or an average of that much, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less, but on the average, eight hours are taken right out. Then another eight hours to make a living. And then you have another eight hours of free time. In other words, in America here, as free citizens, you can do anything in the world that you want to with that, that other eight hours. You can sin, you can spend, you can uh, establish good habits, you can establish bad habits, you can re-educate yourself and your mind during those eight hours. But actually, what are you doing with those eight hours? Now there's going to be the determining factor as to how you grade yourself on this particular question. How you're budgeting of your, the use of your time to the best advantage. Do you have a system of actually uh, put, uh, making all of your time count? Of course you have the first 16 hours, they're pr practically taken, uh, taken care of automatically, but the other eight hours is not taken care of automatically. That's something that you can do pretty much as you want to with. It's flexible. Number 24. Lack of controlled enthusiasm. Now there's a honey too. Enthusiasm is among the most uh, valuable of the, of the emotions, beyond any question of doubt, provided that you can turn it on and off just like you would water at a spigot or an electric light. Now if you can turn your enthusiasm on when you want to and then turn it off whenever you want to, then you can grade yourself 100% on that. But lack of the ability to do that would raise you somewhere down the, the other way, down toward that little zero. Now, um, how do you go about controlling your enthusiasm? Have you ever thought about your willpower, what, what it was placed there for? You have a power of will, and what's the, what's the purpose of that power of will? It's for the discipline. That power of will is for discipline over your mind. So you can make your mind whatever you want it to be. You can form habits, whatever kind of habits you want. I have never been able to find out or to determine in my own mind which is the worst. No enthusiasm at all, a cold fish. Or red hot enthusiasm out of control. They're both bad. Now, if somebody made me mad right now, I could turn off my enthusiasm just like that and turn on something else <laughs> that would be much more appropriate, maybe, provided I didn't use the wrong language. But there has been a time when I could turn on the anger much more quickly than I could turn on enthusiasm, and I couldn't turn it off near as easily. <laughs> That's something you'll have to overcome, too the ability to turn on any of your emotions or to turn them off. Number 25, intolerance. That is a closed mind based on ignorance or prejudice in connection with religious, racial, political, and economic ideas. Now there you are. How do you rate on that one? be a marvelous thing if you could rate a hundred percent on that and say that you have an open mind on all subjects toward all people at all times. But if you could say that, you'd probably not be human, you'd be a saint. <laughs> However, there are times, I suppose, when uh, if you made up your mind to be open-minded on all these things, you could for a little while. I know I can for a little while. <laughs> However, suppose you can't grade 100% on that one. Suppose that you can't be open-minded toward all people at all times, on all subjects. What is the next best thing to do? Oh, of course, be tolerant some of the time. Now, that's a good one. 
that's all right. <laughs> and if you if you try that out, uh, the more you uh, try it out, the more you'll uh, that sometime will take on more and more time, and eventually you'll get to where tolerance will be a habit with you instead of intolerance. You know there are people in this world, and I regret to say that they're in the vast majority who, when they meet others immediately begin to look for the things that they don't like in the other people and they always find things they don't like. Then there's another type of person and I notice that this other type of person is always much more successful, much more happy, much more welcome when he comes around, who when he meets a person, whether it's an acquaintance or a stranger, immediately begins not only to look for the things that he likes in that person, but to compliment them, say something about them, or to do something about them, or to indicate that he recognizes good qualities instead of bad ones. I get a great thrill when somebody walks up to me and says, Napoleon, aren't you Napoleon Hill? I say, yes, I'm Gilly. Well, I want to tell you, Mr. Hill, how much good I got out of your book. Well, I, I just thrive on that. I love it. Does me a lot of good. Unless, of course, they rub it on too thick. <laughs> and you can do that too, you know. But I've never seen the person yet that didn't, uh, wouldn't respond in kind uh, if you complimented that person. Even a pussycat, as bad-natured as they are, if you stroke him on the back, uh, will curl up his tail and begin to purr. Cats are not very friendly, but you can make them friendly if you do the things the cat likes. <laughs> 26, failure to cooperate with others in the spirit of harmony. Well, there are circumstances in life, I suppose, where your failure to cooperate would be justified. Or are there? I can say there are a lot of circumstances where you'd fail to cooperate. I come into contact with people very often who want me to do things that I can't possibly do for them. They want my influence. They want me to write letters of recommendation. They want me to make telephone calls for them. Well, I can't do it. I can't cooperate unless I'm sold on what I'm cooperating with and with whom I'm cooperating. And uh, you'd be like that too. Number 27, possession of power or wealth not based on merit or earned. Well, I'll, I hope you won't have any trouble grading yourself on that one. <laughs>